It really is an honor to, uh, to be here to offer some preliminary remarks uh, as we undertake an examination of civility in the American justice system. I want to do one thing, though, at the outset. I want to personally acknowledge and thank Bill Dressel for his years of dedicated, resourceful, and innovative leadership of the National Judicial College. Right? It's also very nice to look out in the audience and be among friends. Uh, I know many of you, so it's always a nice venue when you can speak to friends. So as we examine the civility's role in the legal profession in the courts, I thought it might be helpful to attempt to put into some context the issue of civility or the growing concern over incivility in the legal profession in our courts. To begin, the current concern about incivility in the practice of law and in our courts is a matter much different from the now often heard lament about the polarization and the incivility that dominate American politics today. Incivility between politicians and political leaders has been a part of the public discourse since the founding of our country. In other words, those who long for the kinder, gentler, political discourse of America's past are doing so based on a myth. For example, during the election of 1800, the partisan press referred to John Adams as, and I quote, a hideous hermorphodactical character, and to Thomas Jefferson as a, quote, mean-spirited, low-level fellow, the son of a half-breed Indian squaw. And so it's gone throughout our over 230-year history. Most recently, we were reminded of our country's history of incivility and political discourse in the movie Lincoln. I assume most of you here have seen the movie Lincoln. So you may recall this exchange between the powerful Pennsylvania Republican House leader Thaddeus Stevens and the New York Democrat Fernando Wood. Thaddeus Stevens, a point of order, Mr. Speaker, if you please. When will Mr. Wood, then Fernando Wood? Mr. Speaker, I still have the floor, and the gentleman from Pennsylvania is out of order. Thaddeus Stevens, when will Mr. Wood conclude his interminable gabble? Some of us breathe oxygen, and we find the mephitic fumes of his oratory a lethal challenge to our plural capacities. Fernando Wood, we shall oppose this amendment and any legislation that so affronts natural law insulting to God and to man. Congress must never declare equal those whom God created unequal. Thaddeus Stevens, in conclusion, slavery is the only insult to natural law, you fatuous nincompoop. So although I might enjoy spending more time this afternoon highlighting some of the more notable insults hurled among political rivals throughout our nation's history, the important point today, the very important point today, is that incivility in the practice of law and in the courts has not been part of the institutionalized culture of the American justice system. To the contrary, for the most part, Civility among and between the members of the bar and civility amongst lawyers, judges, and those resolving their disputes in court have been the norm throughout our country's legal history. Moreover, and this seemed very important to me, there has been a connection throughout our nation's history between the civility of the bar and the bench and our adherence in this country to the rule of law. Consider for a moment the stark contrast between the incivility directed toward John Adams, the politician, and the actions of John Adams, a young Boston lawyer, 30 years earlier. On a snowy night in Boston in 1770, British soldiers taunted by a mob of hundreds throwing rocks and snowballs, those British soldiers opened fire, killing five Bostonians. With the public enraged by what they saw as an act of brutality by their British occupiers, 
Eight soldiers and their captain were indicted for murder. Because of the virulent anti-British sentiment in Boston at the time, no lawyers in the city would agree to step forward to defend the soldiers, believing it would end their legal careers. However, John Adams, then an outspoken critic of the British occupation, courageously stepped forward and took the case. Adams' act demonstrated at the very founding of our country that lawyers and the courts must always rise above the demagoguery and the incivility of the political and public discourse to preserve justice and ultimately our country's adherence to the rule of law. The captain and six of his men were acquitted while two others were convicted of the lesser crime of manslaughter and I couldn't, result, couldn't resist this little bit of trivia. The two that were convicted of manslaughter for their lesser crime they were immediately stepped forward and had their thumbs branded with an M. Of his decision to represent the British soldiers, Adams wrote in his diary, the part I took in the defense of Captain Preston and the soldiers procured me anxiety and obliquity enough. It was, however, one of the most gallant, generous, manly, and disinterested actions of my whole life, and one of the best pieces of service I rendered to my country. Judgment of death against those soldiers would have been as foul a stain upon this country as the execution of the Quakers or witches anciently. My point in mentioning the Adams Chronicle is that civility in the practice of law and the courts is not just about treating opposing counsel, the court, clients, and others with courtesy, dignity, and kindness. It is, importantly, about maintaining the public's trust and confidence in the American justice system and ultimately the rule of law. Most scholars and historians today credit the power of judicial review for the longevity of our constitutional democracy. I think in that regard it does us all well to remember that the acquisition, acquiescence to judicial power by the other branches of government and the public throughout our nation's history is founded solely on the perceived, the perceived legitimacy and independence of the courts. In a speech to the American Bar Association in 1998, Justice Anthony Kennedy reminded us that civility and judicial independence are indeed connected values and that are essential and integral to the preservation of the rule of law. According to Justice Kennedy, for the rule of, of law to survive, we must preserve three fundamental principles. The responsibility of the individual, the rationality of the legal profession in the courts, and most importantly, civility. Regarding civility, Justice Kennedy observed that civility has deep roots in the idea of respect for the individual. We are civil to each other because we respect one another's aspirations and equal standing in a democratic society. Civility defines our common cause in advancing the rule of law. A similar view has been expressed by Professor Stephen Carter in his book, Civility, Manners, Morals, and the Etiquette of Democracy, in which Carter states, civility assumes that we will disagree. It requires us not to mask our differences, but to resolve them respectfully. Civility requires that we express ourselves in the ways that demonstrate our respect for others. Unfortunately, there is a growing concern about incivility in the practice of law and in our courts of this country. A concern that should incivility become culturally institutionalized and accepted in the American justice system, it will erode the public's confidence and trust in the justice system. Unfortunately, again, and in fact, there's already evidence, there is already evidence of the impact that incivility can have on the public's confidence in the courts. Over the last few years, elections of judges to the Wisconsin Supreme Court have been nasty, decidedly pardon, partisan battles. 
These battles appear to have produced what has been described by one commentator as, quote, a dysfunctional Supreme Court whose lack of civility among its members led to a physical altercation between two justices to the embarrassment of the court and the embarrassment of that state. A poll conducted in July 2011 by 2020 Insight Polling showed that Wisconsin voters' confidence in their Supreme Court had plummeted to just 23%, down from 52% just three years earlier. So as we examine the importance of civility in this symposium, it seems important to always keep in mind that civility in the practice of law in the courts is not passed down in our DNA. It must be modeled, it must be taught, and it must be nurtured from one generation to another. Today, many, many young lawyers have little or no exposure to civility in law school. As a result, new lawyers may legitimately wonder if they can act civilly and succeed given the realities of today's legal world. We must ensure that the new lawyers of today understand that zealous advocacy, zealous advocacy and success and civility are not incompatible, but indeed are complementary. I hope that each of us here today would reject the assertion that some, of our, that some in our profession have been made that civility is, quote, anachronistic and incompatible, quote, with the modern practice of law today. Toward the end of the symposium, we will attempt to identify the important principles of civility and identify the ways in which civility and the practice of law and in the courts can be maintained and fostered. In that regard, I want to offer just some observations about civility in a place with which I'm most familiar, Oregon. I'm pleased to say that today, the Oregon State Bar and the Oregon Courts enjoy a national reputation for civility and professionalism. There are, I think, multiple reasons for that reputation, some of which may be compatible with your own states. First, over the generations, our state has been well served by the efforts of members of the bar and the bench to model civility and to actively advocate for maintaining high standards of professional behavior in the legal profession. Both of my predecessors as Chief Justices were models of civility in their own right and did much during their tenures as Chiefs to publicly promote principles of civility and professionalism. A second reason is the size of the Oregon State Bar. Unlike the states where many of you come from, in relative size, there are only 14,000 practicing lawyers in Oregon. We have a level of commitment to auxiliary programs like the Campaign for Equal Justice in which Oregon lawyers contribute annually over a million dollars a year to fund legal aid services for the poor. We have a very robust pro bono representation of indigent clients, and we have other cooperative efforts that I think foster a sense of community in the profession. There is also one more fact. Because the Oregon State Bar is so small in relative terms, Oregon lawyers know they will likely encounter opposing counsel again and again. A third reason is that the Oregon Bar and the Oregon Courts are well served by the active efforts of enterprises like the Oregon State Bar's Commission on Professionalism. There are ongoing annual presentations to incoming classes at the three Oregon law schools to attempt to ensure that from the very outset, from the very outset of their legal careers, lawyers are exposed to the standards of civility and professionalism expected of an Oregon lawyer. Nevertheless, like other bars in this country, Oregon is facing a new set of challenges in preserving and enhancing the traditions of civility and professionalism. The traditional paradigm that law firms actually trained new lawyers and in doing so modeled and transmitted a tradition of civility is no longer the norm. 
Recent graduates of Oregon's three law schools are now employed by law firms in dismally low numbers. Many of their classmates are either unemployed or underemployed in a job unconnected to law practice or have begun law practice on their own. Those that are beginning law practice on their own are entering the legal profession with little by the way of practical guidance in how to go about establishing a productive legal career that can, be, that can benefit their clients and at the same time serve the important public interests, including having legal disputes resolved amicably and expeditiously. Even those new lawyers who are able to find employment in established firms will feel the pressure of billable hour expectations and the pressures to be hard driving winners to ensure that those law firms can continue to drive profit in a declining economic environment. Ultimately, ultimately, however, the long term health of the legal profession requires that lawyers be seen as trusted resources for resolving disputes and not as expensive hired guns that generate huge legal bills in long, drawn out legal bickering. So in the face of that reality, we implemented in Oregon during my tenure as Chief Justice what we call the New Lawyer Mentoring Program. The New Lawyer Mentoring Program is designed to assist new lawyers in developing the practical skills and the judgment necessary to achieve success in the practice. But more importantly, it is being designed to instill ethical, civility, and professionalism values that characterize excellent lawyers and that foster the public's confidence and trust in the American justice system. Participation is required of all new lawyers admitted from 2011 on unless they have practiced in some other jurisdiction for two years. In Oregon, every new bar admittee is paired with an experienced practitioner. Together they design the new lawyer's individual mentoring program from required and elective components. The required activities introduce the new lawyer into the legal community. More importantly, they affirm ethical, civility, and professionalism standards. They offer an overview of litigation and transactional practice, and they provide guidance on law office management and successful client relationships. The mentor serves as a role model and a trusted counselor teaching the new lawyer how to think and act like a lawyer and provide a safe environment for the first phase of the new lawyer's professional growth. Those of us who were involved in developing this mentoring program, we are excited about the possibilities it holds, particularly the opportunity it presents for preserving and enhancing civility and professionalism in the practice of law and the courts. I'm hopeful and even confident that it will help us to preserve the ethical, civility, and professional values that have been the hallmark of Oregon's justice system. Finally, I want to touch briefly on a subject, on the subject of self-represented litigants. Today, in 60% of the family law cases nationwide, at least one party is not represented by a lawyer, and frequently, neither party is represented. The traditional adversarial system that these litigants enter feature long, drawn-out court procedures involving hearings and rules of procedure and evidence that they know nothing about. These cases are new territory for lawyers and judges. They're unsure of their role, and they can become increasingly frustrated with the self-represented litigant. It is likely, however, that the number of self-represented litigants will only increase as the upcoming generations increasingly believe that the answer to every problem, including trying a case in a court of law, can be found on the internet. Accordingly, it seems that no examination of civility in the courts can be complete without some discussion of the evolving presence of self-litigants in Americans' courts. So in closing, I want to thank all of you for attending this important event commemorating the National College's 50th year and for all of your shared commitment to maintaining
and fostering the very important value of civility in the practice of law and in our courts. Thank you.